Okay, so what we're going to be talking about tonight is technical debt. I think there are two words that put fear into any product owner and any development team. We're going to be talking about this in three different sections. Firstly, we're going to be talking about what are the major causes of technical debt and two guiding principles on how to evade them. Secondly, we're going to be talking about what's the difference between good technical debt and bad technical debt. And finally, we're going to be talking about if you have a problem with technical debt on your team, how can you motivate your team to fix it and how can you motivate your product owners to prioritize it? Most of the exercises that we do tonight are based around group learning, so I would invite everybody, please share as much as you can, because something that might seem very trivial to you could be incredibly valuable to the person next to you. So that's the kind of logistics, so let's kick into it. So we're going to start, what we're going to kick off with is just kind of talking about what technical that means to two of us. So Josh, do you want to? Yeah, so many variations of this. So a lot of the time I find a problem with product teams that want to focus on the stuff on, the, on top of the car bonnet and then exterior, all the pretty stuff, user experience. And what I kind of guide them towards is the work underneath the bonnet, the stuff that you can't see is the stuff that's going to keep us actually floating in the future. It's going to keep sustainability, longevity, keep the car running. And it's such a simplistic example, but when you put it in those terms, and when your product owner drives a BMW, he knows the importance of actually getting his service regularly. He knows the importance of getting the oil levels checked, the water levels. So in that way, he kind of keeps his frame of mind where he's not going six months down the line and something blows up in the engine and the cost is a hell of a lot bigger. It's a false economy. So that'll be my simple description. Okay, thank cool. you, Josh. Thank you. So I'm just gonna take this opportunity to bring up our PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Josh, for sharing what technical debt means to you. So technical debt was a term coined by Ward Cunningham, one of the signatures on the original Agile Manifesto. He was working within a financial organization and he needed a way of teaching people about opportunity costs, about the value of, work, of rework and several forms of waste. So what he discovered is a lot of these, a lot of these concepts mapped to the debt concept and compounding interest in the financial industry. So he created the debt metaphor, the technical debt metaphor, as an educational tool to teach people. That's all it ever was, a way of teaching things. So he has a great five minute talk where he describes this on YouTube, so I've just uh, paraphrased this here. So technical debt is similar to financial debt. If you don't control your debt, the repayments will grow and prevent you from taking opportunities. Sometimes debt is unavoidable, but if managed correctly, you can use it to your advantage. Make sense? <coughs> Great. And this is one of those terms that has become very overloaded in the industry. So that's why I always like to go back to where the term originated from. So when you're using it in the future, you can say, actually, there is good, bet, good debt and bad debt. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump into our first exercise. So I'm very happy everybody's in groups of five. So our first exercise is around feedback loops. So before we jump into our first exercise, I just need to talk about it one tiny bit. The exercise itself is incredibly self-explanatory. But we are using the term defect and we've overloaded the term defect. So when we talk about a defect, it's not just code that crashes your entire system. It's also something that's designed in not a maintainable way, not a scalable way, and something that misses what your product owner wants. So when you read defects on these cards, we're not just talking about code that crashes the system. Yes, we are, but think of maintainability, scalability, and building what your user really wants. So we need table facilitators. So since this room is quite narrow, we just need one person on each table to kind of help run the exercises. So do we have one person on each table? Please raise your hand. Looks okay. like we got one here. <laughs> OK, so you have one person on each table? Awesome. So uh, Josh will go and hand out the envelopes, because the room is quite narrow. Who's the facilitator? OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Do you get one? Okay, great. And if you just want <laughs> to start by opening <laughs> up the section one. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have 15 minutes for this exercise. Hello. Yeah, so section one is where we all begin. <laughs> Okay. 
Yeah. Oh, uh, the raise. Uh, when somebody raises their hand, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. So somebody just asked what the raise hands mean. So when somebody raises their hand and you see it, you put up your hand and you go quiet. So then, very quickly, the entire room goes quiet. It's great yeah. kindergarten trick. Yeah. Okay. So joking. thanks. For uh, thanks everybody for uh, following that along with that exercise. So I love doing this with teams uh, because it starts a really good conversation about like why you need to push your feedback loops earlier in the cycle. So what I'm going to do is ask a few teams to share their insights. So if you got to the end of section three, we were asking teams to just come up with some table insight. But I know some people didn't get that far, but I'll still ask, you know. Yeah, of course. No, 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 you're okay. So who'd like to share an insight? Oh, great, we've got one from this table. So, um, yeah, so I was just sharing that um, in the development work we do, we uh, make use of continuous integration. So uh, whenever I commit a change to the software, a whole load of tests run automatically and give me feedback uh, as to whether I've broken anything within sort of five, 10 minutes. Um, so that's, that's a really sort of short feedback loop that we've, we've found to be very valuable. Awesome. This table I wrote something just there. Yeah. I just wanted to share that uh, we, while we were discussing, we arrived to the conclusion that uh, the answer could be very different depending on you have a dedicated product owner or not. Because uh, if you don't have a dedicated product owner, when you have the fed form by product owner, it could have been already released. Yeah. Although that's uh, not, maybe not very strong case. Uh, not a no, that's perfect, right? And the reason we we're asking for kind of individual insights is like, it's just sharing. You know, and it's like, although you mightn't have your own individual product owner, you acknowledge that it kind of pushes your feedback loop up the line. And other people in the room might hear that insight and have a pointer. So, anyone have, oh, we got an insight from the back. Yeah, we, we found it quite easy to identify the um, quality of the different uh, defects, hmm. right? It was relatively clear. But then um, putting value on that, um, we found it quite hard. Hmm. Because always since there was, it depends on, and it depends on how long it takes until you go into automated testing, right? Mm. Could be hours, could be days or whatever. So that, um, to, to identify the bandwidth of potential cost, we found it quite hard. Mm. And that's why it's quite hard in, in this sort of experience where you're dealing with people from lots of different teams. If you're doing this workshop with your own team and everybody's on the same platform and things like that and you want to drive the behavior of testing early and often, this is a very good exercise. Because you can say, if we just caught that bug earlier, it wouldn't have, you know, it would be 400 times less expensive, you know, if we just tried pair programming. Is it bug or technical test? Or are they the same thing? So that's a good question. <laughs> uh, so like when we think about technical debt, we're talking about like... It can necessarily not be a bug. Yeah. So bugs, bugs inside something not being built correctly, right? Where technical debt can act, you can actually go into debt to leverage an opportunity in the future. So let's say, let's say you want to try out a hypothesis. Would people use a certain function? So you just mock something together really quickly, release to a few users, and see if it works or not. But how do you classify the feedback loops for that then? I thought this was based on technical, identifying technical debt. So like any of the feedback, the- We have it my naivety wide. I'm confused. Oh no, uh, no worries. So the concept here we're going for is shorter feedback loops always lend more value. So if you can deal with your product owner as regularly as possible. But how is that connected to technical debt? I have the same question. Um, because it's okay. te technical yeah. debt to me is okay. yeah. one thing. No, no, no. Uh, feedback loops kind of, they reduce bugs, they reduce defects. That's not, tech, that's not okay. that's, as I understood, technical debt. Okay, so what we're going to be going on to in a couple of minutes is the main cause of technical debt. And then we're kind of going to rope into why feedback loops will uh, get after a lot of these. Uh, uh, this, answer, this question will yeah. be answered in five minutes. Thank you. Okay, <coughs> but uh, you're correct. Okay, anyone have any more insights? Yeah, we were just talking about, um, so we've got a whole CI pipeline of automated yeah. tests, but we, we found where we work that um, replacing manual testing during the release phase with automated testing also improved our feedback loop because we could really release more frequently and release small pieces. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Anyone else want to share anything? We heard, oh yeah, we didn't hear from this. It was just about once when I was developing a report that was going to be production critical for the company. Mm. And the key to some of its success was, although there'd been a long prototyping phase, mm. um, in the end, on one particular day, myself and the production manager 
we're just constantly reviewing and working on it. So we burned through several versions. And then that took away most of the future work because there was the focus. Mm. You know, he was the key end user to say this is okay, and I was the key developer to, you know, to produce it. Whereas if we have had a long cycle of different people looking at it, that would have been potentially weeks, months of work. Yeah. But it's just getting the people that we needed to be in the same space. Yeah, it's all fo it's focus and it's like reduced context switching. Okay, great. So let's move on to. So why we did that exercise, and as it was so pointed out there, it is what we want to show there was the power of uh, feedback loops because it's one of the principles we're going to talk about reducing technical debt. So what causes technical debt? So this study was done in 2015. Uh, can we? Can everybody see the screen? Uh, I'll talk through it anyway. Uh, so it was done in 2015 with over they queried over 2,000 software developers about what was the biggest cause of technical debt, right? And this study has been replicated several times since. And it all comes to the same conclusion. So although time constraints can occasionally cause a lot of technical debt, generally it's architectural choices which lead to most of the technical debt out there. So we're just going to talk through the top four. Right? Bad architectural choices. So when you talk about bad architectural choices, nobody ever really makes a bad choice. You kind of, uh, you learn something, and then like when you make a bad choice, what really happens is, uh, you made a choice, then you learn something in the future, and that choice turn, turns out to have been the correct one. But nobody's ever set aside and said, I'm going to be re make a really bad choice. You just didn't have all the information you had afterwards. So that's been fast, right? Yeah, exactly. Just the learning cycles. OK, and just how you get our information. So we're going to share all the slides afterwards, so don't worry about this. Apologies. Uh, and I know you're not taking a picture of me, so it's OK. <laughs> uh, awesome. So that was, the main, that was the main problem, bad architecture choices. Next was overly complex code. So when you talk about the word complex, so this comes from the Latin word complet, right, which means interwoven. So if you actually think about it in that term, it makes a lot more sense in software engineering of why it's very bad. Because if somebody was to say to you, this person's written some very complex code, you'd be like, oh, it must have been difficult. But if you actually use the term from its original term, this person's written some very interwoven code, well, that sounds terrible. That sounds it's not maintainable, it's not scalable, and you can't extend it. So it's why when you talk about bad ar like architectural choices, we always try to make things modular like Lego, not knitted like a jumper. So uh, if you think of the word complex as interwoven, this makes a lot more sense. In so this is a byproduct from the first one, hmm? basically. Yeah. The second one is byproduct of the first one. It is, but I like to think that they can be different. Like I think overly complex code can happen at a very small level, and architecture choices could nearly happen at a bigger level when you're pushing things together. But you're right, it's all interwoven. OK, great. And, and the other two we're just going to mention is lack of documentation and inadequate testing. So essentially, when t like there's many different reasons to create documentation, understanding, uh, sharing, you know, sharing in the future. Maybe you just skipped documentation because you didn't have time, or maybe you just thought things were so self-explanatory that it didn't need documentation. So the reason we did the feedback loop exercise, right, it's one of the principles that can actually get after a lot of these. Right, that when we have to go back and refactor something because it was created overly complex, it does cost us a lot of money. And that's what we're showing with this exercise, that we waited till code reviews to get after this, where if we did it in pair programming, it would have been a lot easier to fix. Architectural, you know, architectural choices, if we have to go back and change something in production, it's going to cost us a lot of money. So it's really like, how much information can we get to people at the very start? So next slide. So yeah, keep going. OK, so the next principle, and uh, we can have a discussion afterwards about you know, what's technical and what's not technical, and why feedback loops are important or not. But just in the interest of fairness to everybody, I'd like to kind of work through the learning outcomes, and then we can have more of an open discussion at the end. So going from strategic to tactical. So this is a personal anecdotal one that I notice quite often. It's like when we talk about bad architectural choices, you know, it's very often for product owners to kind of blame the development team. It's like, I can't believe they built something that doesn't hold the capacity that we want. So what I've seen happen more than once is like, we have a vision, and then the next day you come in and there's lots of stories in Jira. Right? So we've gone from the strategic point of view to tactical far too quickly. So if we go to the next slide. So what should really happen? Right? You should have a vision. right? And I know visions take days to come up with for some products. right? But that's not really where all the, all the pain and suffering ends. You need to sit down and have that more in-depth conversation about, 
okay, we're about to build this thing. What do we actually need to talk about? Do we need to talk about security, reliability, performance, capacity? How many of us worked on projects before where something gets released and suddenly the capacity doesn't make sense anymore? So although in Agile we're very used to having stories that are individual units of value, we still need that overarching conversation about why are we actually building this? So there's a myriad of different techniques. There's story mapping. I have a link here to Jeff Patton. He does an amazing talk on it. There's impact <coughs> mapping. And there's all the whole MVP learning cycle. Write down your hypotheses and test through these. So if we think back to the main cause of technical debt, architectural choices, overly complex code, if we do a bit more upfront planning, we'll actually get after a lot of these. Yeah. Sorry, again, yeah. I have a question. When you say architectural choices, is it about the infrastructure or is it the product itself? Is it, or is it the design you're saying? The design is actually causing the technical attack. So when we talk about architecture choices, we're talking about how the application is designed. So I think it's all very interwoven that if you don't actually... So design is the main cause of technical attack then? Yes. So, but they're all very interwoven that like you actually can't design an application if you don't know why you're building it, who are your customers. You know, I think quite often if we talk about architecture choices, a lot of the blame falls onto people in architect roles. But if we think about it, have they been equipped for success? Have they been, you know, have we sat down and told them the vision of what we want to build? Have we sat down for days and actually talked about this is the way we're going to build it, this is how we're going to ramp up users? So it's try not to go from strategic to tactical far too soon. It's like, I think, you know, I think we have, a, we have a notion that like technical debt is essentially just building pipelines out. You know, it's, it's not really that. So yeah. I'll hand you over to Josh to carry us through section two. Cool. So there's an association that I hear a lot of, you know, at work in a community that all technical debt is bad, it's an evil. Um, does anyone agree that, with that statement? All technical debt is evil? Yeah. yeah? Sometimes it's a necessary evil. Yeah. Thank you. All right. You want to come up and do the talk? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so not all debt is bad debt, right? Sometimes you can leverage short-term debt to get a long-term benefit. I'll use a really simplistic example. And for the technologists in here, forgive me, but it, it will make sense. If I'm in the kitchen and I'm trying to make chicken breast with vegetables and salad, I start chopping up the salad, you know, things are falling on the floor, the vegetables as well, the chopping board gets dirty, I start frying the chicken, my missus is going crazy in the background because there's so much mess everywhere. Then if I have to stop every time, clean the, chop clean the chopping board, clean the frying pan, pick up the stuff off the floor, what's that going to do? It's going to interrupt my flow. My chicken's going to get probably cold by the time I get to it. So sometimes it's actually okay to incur some level of debt, which is basically everything on the floor right now, my missus is having a heart attack, um, to actually get me to the outcome of having some good chicken breast. But there's a balance, right? So if I've done all that mess, which has happened before, and I come in the kitchen again the next day to cook a chicken breast, and I incur the same amount of mess, then that's where it becomes a bad debt. That's where things get actually get in my way of making chicken breast. And then my missus in the background going, I told you so. So I won't wrap it on too much. What we're going to do is jump on to the second exercise. So our facilitators on each table, where are you? Okay, cool. So just open up. It's just one, exactly. So just open up the envelope, follow the instructions. And we're gonna explore good debt and bad debt. Keep the questions coming. Cheers. <laughs> How do we find that? It was done. Who put mortgage under bad debt? Interesting. I wanted to, but yeah, mortgage is actually a good debt, in my opinion. How did you guys find the exercise? Any insights? Well, it's like everything depends. You're yeah, definitely a consultant, not talking, honestly. <laughs> I can argue every single one of those. 
like it. If someone kills someone in the street, it depends. Like and what, what's the reason? Is it right though? Well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> if you're being attacked, you have to kill someone just to That's true. survive. I like, okay, we've got to watch out for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so guys, just give your attention. Um, it's not like definite good or bad. I have my own opinions, of course. Uh, it's just to get discussion going. Um, fights have broken out over this. Just to let you know, I'm joking. Um, so the next exercise is, so before I move on to that, actually, the real essence of this, just to keep it really simple, you can leverage short-term debt to get a long-term benefit. For example, investing is, in my opinion, a good debt because you're putting some money away for the future, essentially. All right, so those are kind of examples. So the next exercise is, actual your context now i want to draw a poster so we're going to test your artistic skills you definitely look an artist to me um, and draw out good and bad debts in product development yeah so draw on your poster good and bad debt in product development yeah yeah cool does it make sense everyone everyone looks confused why okay so we I'm have walls they're amazing walls but uh, let's try to be respectful to people in red hat and uh, not move too much yeah, stuff uh, yeah 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 uh, okay so I think we can have one group, uh, if you want to draw your poster and then we'll stick it up at the end, but uh, you can draw them all on the table. It depends so. how good it is. If it's not good, I'm going to throw it away. Yeah. So just, um... Okay, so I think uh, let's get drawn. <laughs> good dead and bad dead in product development. Right, we'll give you guys uh, six minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right, I think we're time's up. Just checking time now. Don't make me kindergarten you. Okay, we will we'll here. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm about to leave there. It's the thing. It's the balance. <laughs> all right, we're all done with the with the posters. Okay, you guys don't happen over here, but it's fine. Where should we put the posters, Kev? Uh, so what we're going to we? do at the end is a bit of a gallery walk of kind of all the artifacts that we've created. <laughs> uh, no, no, yours is amazing, not not sugar, as you said. So what we're going to do is put. Uh, we can just leave the posters on the table, and then after people get a slice of pizza and a bit of beer, we yeah. can just walk around. So. What we can do is, you present the next section, and then we'll just ask people to put the posters up here. Okay, cool. Okay. That includes you guys over as, as well. Yeah. That table there. <coughs> All right, cool. Um, so, that was a hard exercise, I'm sure, for all of you. Um, this is Martin Fowler's technical deck quadrant. Anyone heard of it? Put your hand up. Okay, that's good. Um, so, this is a fantastic concept to, to look at how you take on technical debt. Um, so when someone says to me, oh Josh, technical debt is all bad. And I've heard to them, actually, it depends. It really does on the circumstances, okay? So what I want to envision is each of these are a window to look through, right? And how you want to take on technical debt. On the top left window we're looking through is deliberate and reckless. I've met developers like this who say, I don't really care. I'm gonna do a proof of concept and I'm gonna productionize it and then I have a heart attack. So this is about no time for design, okay? Deliberate reckless. The other side of the scale is deliberate prudent, okay? So prudent is you're looking ahead and you're conscious of incurring a level of tech debt to ship something. So if a product owner comes up to the teams that I work with, he goes, look, I need something in two weeks. We've got to ship it because actually the priority is not technical quality is the feedback from what we're getting from the product. So ship now, but clean up after. Remember the kitchen analogy. Just make sure you clean up the, the, the pan and the vegetables after, okay? Just be conscious of that. Deliberate, prudent. Inadvertent, reckless. So this is actually, you don't really have a clue about what you're doing. Um, and okay, you lack some sort of engineering skills. It's all, it's all cool. Yeah, so just incompetence, okay? The last window to look through is invertent prudent. So this is, hindsight is a wonderful thing, right? And <laughs> this is an interesting uh, window to look through because you're never gonna get a, get a perfect design, right? Well, need to switch over. You're never gonna get the perfect design because we know we work in software, it's a complex domain. And the thing is, the kind of uncertainty tells us that the more we do, the more we find out. Everyone know the kind of uncertainty where 
Yeah, uncertain, uncertain, getting more certain, certain, certain. So you're going to learn as, as you actually go. So this one is a great way to actually communicate to management to say, look, we just have to accept this as part of building the work we're doing. We're, so we're software, right? Does this make sense to everyone? Question me if you don't, if you don't find it useful. Okay, so just four window panes to look through. Okay, so what we don't want to, so what we do want to do is, is say this is bad debt, because if you're reckless, it's going to be bad debt, man. Yeah? And this is good debt. Deliberate and prudent. And inadvertent and prudent. That's just, again, hindsight. You had the good intentions of actually doing a good design, thinking about the future. But it just so happens you learn some things along the way. It just happens, right? Cool. Makes sense? Yep. Okay. I can post a slide after um, and send you a link for this. This is a great communication starter for a product owner and some teams as well. Awesome. So maybe we'll invite uh, our table facilitator just to grab your posters and if you could just uh, lay them on this table here. And uh, also this table, so if you just want to put your one here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yep, yeah, everyone ready? Okay, fine. Don't worry, it's nearly over, I promise. <laughs> I'm falling asleep. Um, cool, so we covered quite a few things today. So defects, seeing the value of shorting the feedback loops, good debt versus bad debt. And the final part of this, of this workshop is looking at how do we motivate a team to address technical debt, okay? So motivation, it comes in two forms, right? So first one is extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic is external factors that external factors that motivate someone. So 20th century work, whereas more brawn than brain, they're motivated by carrot and a stick. You do something good, I give you, I give you something. You do something bad, you get hit on the head. Yeah? You guys with me? Cool. Extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation, this is about all the internal factors that motivate an individual. So we've got Dan Pink, right, who pioneered um, the work around motivation. Where is he from? Hmm. He's a, what is he? He's a... Uh, so uh, Dan Pink, uh, he's known as a talk leader in, in motivational psychology. So, yeah. He wrote a book called Drive, which is kind of, although it's nothing new, oh, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just been packaged very well and it's uh, very digestible. So yeah, so he pioneered most of the work around intrinsic motivation. Uh, but the important part is that he introduced these three parts which is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Have you all come across these things? Yeah. Okay, good. Right, so you can tell me what they are. So, what's autonomy? Someone, who said yeah? Who said it? Okay. Autonomy is empowering people to actually take decisions. Cool, all right. So being self-directed. Okay, nice. And being, having ownership towards working towards a goal, right? Mastery. Being good at what you do and having a, this, no, I'm talking about the books in masters is you're getting good at whatever craft you're doing yes. and just feeling like you're progressing and having control and mastery. I can't use the word mastery, but yeah. That's fine, no. Yeah, good. Okay, so all right, continuously improving. Okay. What's the last one? Who wants to say yes? Purpose. Alright, who wants to explain purpose? Who said yes? Um, you've got a reason for do actually doing it. Yeah. What are you really you understand why you're doing something? Right, yeah. Cool, so purpose is, yeah, is the why. Do you want to add something to that? Uh, no, it's perfect. Okay, cool. Right, so we want to actually bridge these intrinsic motivators with the team so they can actually address the technical debt. Cool, so. So uh, just before we jump into the final exercise, uh, let's just talk about each of these intrinsic motivators in terms of technical debt. And all we're going to do is a quick little ball toss. And uh, what we're going to do is like talk about how, let's say, mastery uh, is enabled by technical debt or slowed down by technical debt, right? So what we're talking about here is you're on your team and you notice that motivation is a problem. You know, is technical debt causing it, right? So who'd like to kick us off? Uh, uh, we can do this kind of, uh, what do you think, how do you think mastery would be affected by technical debt? Anybody want to answer that question? Yes, good man. Well, it's an opportunity to learn as to maybe what you've done wrong and how to fix it. Yeah, that's a good. That's a that's a good point. Okay, Aiden. If you uh, if you're constantly building up technical debt, you never feel like you're making a perfect 
product are you? you think you're leaving loads of damage in the work you're doing, so you never feel the satisfaction. No. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Anyone have any more points around mastery and technical debt? Yeah. I can see some people would regard technical debt as actually giving them mastery. So if you've got um, a legacy system that people are very familiar with and know inside out, then moving away from that could, I can see people see that as a threat. Okay, good stuff. Okay, purpose? Anybody want to talk about how purpose and technical Yeah, not just refactoring for the sake of refactoring. Would mastery be purpose? Would mass? So, to some people, like when you think about purpose as seeing an impact of your work is another way of looking at it. So, some people will get mastery over, let's say, reducing a technical debt in a huge database. They're all intertwined. Uh, anyone else have one for purpose? Okay, last question. So how was autonomy affected negatively by technical debt? You can't do what you, can't do what you want to do. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> I should, yeah. Uh, no, but that's, that's perfect because like, you have to spend all your time. Yeah. Essentially, if a development team is money, you have to spend half your money every you know, release just fixing technical debt. And it's not a good place to be. And what I really feel sorry for, because I've talked with many teams over the years, it's like when you go into a team, and they've inherited all this technical debt from another team. It's kind of like they're paying a mortgage on a house that they've never, they never lived in the house while it was nice. <laughs> now the walls are falling down yeah. and they're constantly paying this back. And it's kind of like, how do you actually motivate a team to fix somebody else's technical debt that they inherited? Like, yeah, you have really cool ideas. You come in and you want to change the world. And then you're like, oh yeah, the leg system is breaking, it's breaking, it's breaking down every time you touch it. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, we have to, we have to go relearn. What, what, yeah. what your predecessor did. Yeah. Oh no, it's really shit. We've got to go back and do it again. Oh no, it's really bad. Oh, we've got to do it back. Oh, I've got an idea to change it. Oh no, we've got to go back and do this. I know. And like for people, when you're on that team, right, and sometimes you do need to motivate teams to get after some of the technical debt. Yeah. That either, like it could be from educating them or just kind of motivating them to remove some old technical debt that they inherited. And even motivating product owners to prioritize this somehow. It's quite difficult, right? So what we're going to do in this last exercise, we're going to ask everybody to come up with some sort of motivational poster that you would even like that you would demonstrate to a team or a product owner, showing something educational about technical debt maybe, or just something that will help you have that conversation with your team to help them address their technical debt. Yeah, just think of it as a pitch because a lot of time the problem that I find is across many different teams I've seen, is that they don't have to actually propose how to tackle the technical debt. They've just got no value proposition whatsoever. They're like blind to it. They're like, yeah, we just want to do a whole backlog of refactoring work. Why? How do we measure it? So this exercise can get, kind of get you into that zone of thinking about how you would pitch technical debt to, to a team, but also a product owner, which is the most important thing. Does it make sense? Yeah? yeah? Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and now we're, now we're solely thinking about bad technical debt. So yeah. we've kind of shifted gears. Cool. Um, and draw, are we drawing as well? Yeah, we're drawing. So uh, we're drawing. Guys, we are drawing uh, yeah. rather than posting our team. Sorry. Okay, hey guys. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Okay, amazing. So great artwork. So what we're going to do now is a quick debrief, right? Well, no, everybody's going to go around and uh, do their poster for like less than a minute. But what we're really talking about here is like bad technical, ba bad, sorry. Uh. <laughs> so, so bad technical that can really slow down a team, right? And prevent it from being valuable, you know, prevent the team from being valuable. And generally it's not a great situation to be in for the team members when they're saddled with technical debt, right? And quite often somebody needs to motivate the team to get after it or they need to motivate their product owner to prioritize it. And sometimes you have to say things many different ways before they really sink in. So now what we're gonna do is see how each table has done their poster and everybody has less than a minute to talk about these, right? So I'm going to invite these people right here because they're the closest to go first, <laughs> right? So less than a minute. So Josh, do you have your phone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Upstairs. No, uh, yes, please stand up and hold up your poster. Uh, um. Sorry. 
This is our glorious poster. Hold it up. <laughs> so, apologies for the, for the great uh, drawings. Obviously, once it lives here. This is Your Code Needs You. Good one. And Make Tomorrow Easier. Uh, real developers write tests. And this is unfinished, but it's Go the Extra Mile Today to... So go extra mile today, um, so you work less tomorrow and get more. Yeah, and then down here we have the free, the free. Uh, obviously, the Tommy Master of Purpose. You have take control. You have recognition. Be a code maverick, and you have earn more. And yeah, that that's how we. That's our motivational poster. So wow. wow. Okay, awesome. So I take your poster and. Uh, so does this team want to go next? Okay, we just have a rather small design idea here, but uh, <laughs> 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 it's, um, it's cut to right close up. Uh, uh, over here we have uh, kill technical death, and we have a picture of the poor developer here being menaced by this sort of beetle, which is kind of about Sobe. And then over here it says, before technical debt kills you. And there's a <laughs> tiny little developer on a massive red beetle. I like that. Awesome. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, the table on the far left. And uh, everybody look at the poster. Sorry. I'll explain the concept also. So uh, what we have tried to demonstrate over here is uh, incremental development of a product. As we develop the product, technical debt starts increasing on the team. Hence, the revenue starts decreasing based on the feedback cycle. Uh, concept that was started earlier. So what we try to demonstrate is, as you move later in the feedback loop, you would start incurring more cost than revenue. So. Fantastic. Okay. Um, and uh, feel free to show the cameraman too. We started off thinking with it, with old diesel tractor to a Tesla, and I thought maybe it's a little bit far-fetched, right? Um, so we just came up with the, the metaphor of a sailing boat, which has a hole in it. Right? So the, more, the bigger the hole, the more water is going to come in, and the more work it is for the team to be able to add. The smaller the hole, hmm. the team the easier sailing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the next table. Right, let's go. Uh, okay, so we were just trying to demonstrate the value of, of dealing with technical debt effectively. Uh, we have a truck laden down with technical debt here, hootling along, doesn't really move very fast, and then shooting off the side of the page at the bottom. It's a well managed uh, load of technical debt. And I'll let the tagline go faster than less tender. Okay. And Okay. Why do I want to go faster? Well, that's the, the faster is not strictly faster. It's just you react a lot better if you have less technical debt. So it's more your agility rather than just the builds up. Nice. Yeah. No, it's also about getting functionality out sooner, right? If you're, if you're managing your tech debt, that will not bother. That might not necessarily mean that your functionality has gone out there. No, but what we're trying to say is a truck full of crap goes slower than a truck with less crap in it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 to, to ship goods, right? It's a rental pool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you will lose some opportunities and your, the value of your software <coughs> will be less. Okay. And, uh, and some way you can measure your the technical that you have is uh, link it to your company uh, KPIs and also compare yourself with uh, competitors that maybe are able to release stuff faster than you can because they don't have so much technical debt. Okay. That's good. Yeah, good mindset. Mm. Okay. Here we go. So we had an idea similar to the thing down there. Really just to try and illustrate the difference between a team that's bogged down with the technical debt's complexity, the lack of tests. It's all getting in their way, their, their freedom. They want to experiment with new things compared to someone that's dealing with the situation and has got the freedom and agility to really move. So we just tried to boil it down to the, the basic pitch. Yeah. And like the important thing here, right, if you're trying to bring in change on a team, teams get so used to having to drive the very slow truck. You know, within like, if, you're, if, you're, if you come from a graduate program and you grow up in an environment where technical data is just parcel and parcel, you just accept that things take ages. So sometimes when you're working, you know, everybody that will come here tonight is in some sort of leadership role where they're trying to make their teams better. Sometimes you just need to do something like a poster like this to say, guys, we're in this very slow truck. We've been here for years. Let's try to get better. So that's brilliant. That was nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so all the posters are amazing. Great work, guys. Uh, so I think we're coming to our end of our time together. So some of the stuff that we said we'd talk about was, you know, a common definition for technical debt, right? As I said, it's essentially just like financial debt. And all it ever was was a metaphor for teaching teaching various XP concepts. I'm going to post the link to the original video uh, onto the Meetup page after this, and I invite everybody to watch it so we can see that not all technical debt is good or bad. So secondly, we want to talk about the main cause of technical debt. We talked about arch you know, arch bad architectural decisions, which is essentially only ever a lack of information at the time of building. And we talked about code complexity, things being interwoven. These are things you can tackle with short feedback cycles. So, and you know, going from strategic to tactical planning, step by step. Don't just, don't have a vision and jump into putting stories in JIRA. It's, you'll end up having to do so much rework over the course of a lifetime, it's not even worth it. That exercise that we did around the feedback loops, so I've done that with multiple, multiple teams. It's a really good exercise just to make people sit down and realize that pair program will actually save the product a lot of money in the long run. So I'd invite everybody to go back and do that. So we talked through good debt versus bad debt. So it's very important to do this with product, you know, product owners as well, to realize that sometimes they could put you in a position where you have to do something reckless, and sometimes you're going to do things that are deliberate, but acknowledge they're different. And last, we talked about motivation. I think everybody kind of understands these concepts, but if people are stuck in the habit of always having to deal with technical debt, they'll never unlock from it. So I hope what people got out of tonight's workshop is that technical debt is not just having a bad CI pipeline. It's building up a lot of good behaviors on your team. Good behaviors in terms of thinking, in terms of prioritizing, and in terms of planning. So that's, that was it. Uh, there's pizzas outside. We've got lots of good posters, so I'd invite. Oh, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, it's around the last part. So yeah. How, do you have any recommendations on how you uh, speak to a management team or a product owner on how to um, deal with technical debts when they don't feel it's a very important thing? A way to approach that topic. So there are several ways. So transparency is always a good option, right? You know, makes things incredibly transparent, show how much it slows you down. But if they're really not getting the concept right, you need to unlock that whole concept that like them controlling the input of a sprint. Let's say everybody understands working in time boxes. Controlling the input doesn't always control the output. That like let's you know, and I think that's a very fundamental thing that if you were to spend fifty percent of your time working on customer features and fifty percent of your time working on technical debt. They might see it as, oh, well, you know, I get half of their time. But let's say you were to spend 95% of your time working on technical solutions to allow you to deliver faster. You might deliver more than you would with a 50-50 split. So unlock that concept of input controls output, which controls outcome, because that, you know, that's incorrect. That's, that's how I do it if they're not getting the transparency. Essentially, 
try to explain it to them like that. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. Yeah, yeah. The output would be dependent on the system you're operating in, right? Yeah. So, so in terms of that, what is that system that needs to be unfolded in front of the product owners? One of the challenges I've found out uh, working in my current role is people don't actually understand the system they're operating in, hence they don't actually understand what are going to be the implications of any of the concepts like tech tech or the other sort of uh, So people understand waste. Like they understand context switching and they understand lag and lead times. You know, I think technical lead is always seen as very much an engineering focus, but you can show waste. You know, like show waste, show show how long things to get take to get out the door, because <coughs> like it's you know like you can't expect people to have an understanding of these concepts. You know, if they've never went to university to learn about them, they've never gone to workshops. Where I've seen a lot of frustrations on teams before in the past is where people just they expect their product owners to realize, oh this Jenkins thing is broken, why isn't he prioritizing it? But it's really the ownership of a lot of different people to educate people. So I think if people aren't getting it, you have an ownership problem to, you know, you have to educate them. So, and you don't have to start with technical things, you can start with kind of manufacturing things, because generally they make more sense to people not from a technical background. Thanks everybody for their time and thanks for being so nice. <laughs>